Great, well, thanks very much for having me here today. I I'm not gonna talk about science so much today as I am gonna talk about the need for uh, the application of innovation in the commercial sector to deliver many of the new discoveries in biomedicine to patients. And it's that commercial phase which has had both huge opportunities in the past 20 years uh, for value creation, but also as also has its challenges as we're finding out, particularly in the large pharmaceutical sector. So um, what I want to do is just um, think a little bit about how we got from here to the position we're now in, where we have a wide range of medicines many of which are highly effective in very complex and challenging diseases. And in order to think about that, I, I think it's helpful to think about three different commercial models for the commercialization of new science discoveries. One is the large pharma model, which as you know has had its challenges in recent years. The second is, is mid-sized pharma, which we're particularly bad at in the, in the UK, but which I think is an extremely interesting space. And the third, of course, is biotech. What I haven't done is I haven't drifted into med tech, diagnostics, digital medicine. Those are arenas which are, in my view, a great deal easier and more tractable in terms of commercialization. The real challenge is making novel drugs uh, that really work. And so I'm gonna stick really to the drug discovery development paradigms and how you get innovation in that sector, simply really for time reasons. Let's just start though by thinking a little bit about the challenges that exist in healthcare that are really limiting in terms of how one can be successful in transferring discovery science into something which is widely applicable. I, innovation is still really the main driver for improved healthcare across the entire healthcare piece. And uh, although it's really abundant, particularly in small and mid-sized companies, innovation is a real challenge to large organizations. And that's true with both large commercial organizations, but also for the large healthcare providers. And we see that regularly within the NHS and also within large pharma companies. And that innovation is really constrained in part by leadership in those domains, but also organizational structures and the regulatory environment. Um, there are also significant challenges in the way we think about healthcare because as the pattern of disease has changed, we still haven't readdressed the issue that our healthcare paradigm is largely focused on acute illnesses in end-stage disease rather than attacking diseases earlier on. And with the advent of chronic diseases, that becomes increasingly important. It's also clear that the taxonomy, the nomenclature of disease is fundamentally flawed in that it was really largely discovered at the beginning of the last century. Uh, and is, disease nomenclature is really used to define phenotypic disorders, phenotypically defined disorders, rather than disorders that are defined from a mechanistic perspective, where the discovery and innovation almost all has to occur at a mechanistic level. So we've got a disconnect between what we call a disease and actually how one's likely to develop therapies uh, to treat it. And um, there is a substantial change in the trend of disease, chronic diseases, um, changing demography, disease which is largely based outside of hospital, which is the current major challenge to healthcare systems. And that's in many ways where much of the opportunity exists uh, for innovation and commercialization. So let me start simply by talking about the large pharma companies. The, you know, there are a dozen of these tables. They rank the large companies. This is the familiar list to you. But it'll also be familiar that almost all these companies have had their challenges uh, over the past decade. Uh, and indeed, as havens for powerful innovation, they have really stopped delivering as major innovative drivers in this space. Um, now, that's not universally true, but it's largely true across many of those listed uh, here on the companies ranked by revenues. 
and, and there are many reasons for that. And, and one is the question, I, why might you bother doing innovation in pharma? As you know, the attrition rate for truly novel targets is extremely high and much higher than it is for follower drugs. There are now a huge number of regulatory hurdles that make novel drug development very challenging, particularly in long-term conditions. Marketing has really become the dominant theme of these companies, and almost all, not quite all, but almost all spend more money on marketing than they do on R&D. So they become marketing vehicles uh, rather than innovation drivers. But in addition, on the, on the poll side, purchasers don't really incentivize novelty, and there's a huge pressure on healthcare budgets, which makes this a very challenging problem. And of course, the notion that you can develop drugs with, with no harm really favors the notion that you don't do anything novel, because that's where all the risk lies. So you can understand why large companies got themselves into rather the wrong space when we're talking about innovation. And this slide reflects what you see when you go to North America and you buy any magazine on the shelf as you're standing in the airport. And that is, these companies have largely been driven by a marketing strategy. This is direct-to-consumer advertising. The majority of ads in, in ordinary magazines in America are pharmaceutical ads, trying to get people to buy complex pharmaceuticals for their particular disease. And I, and I show this slide for two reasons. One is it reflects the switch in effort and indeed funding into the marketing space, particularly where direct-to-consumer advertising occurs. And secondly, the sort of lack of reality of this whole strategy in the sense that almost invariably the people you see in these ads look completely healthy, a great deal healthier than anybody I ever see in my clinic in the hospital. They all have perfect teeth and they're all less than the age of 30 which isn't really consistent with the idea that they're about to die from some ghastly disorder. And if you start to market your drugs in that fashion, then don't be surprised if you see this, which was present in the same magazine I bought, which is, if people think they're buying toothpaste, they will be very surprised indeed if they die from that purchase. And, and that's what happens, and as a result, you end up in these big class action suits. So there's a cyclical problem with the notion that the pharmaceutical industry is about marketing, not innovation, and that that marketing should be di direct to consumer in the sense that these uh, should be sold as if they're completely safe over-the-counter uh, products. So the industry got itself into real trouble. You'll remember these uh, major headlines from the past decade. But in 2000, about 2006, 2007, it was pretty clear that the thing was going to fall off a cliff. And this is data in 2007 that shows, first of all, the P.E. ratios, which had already slumped to roughly the P.E. ratio you would have if you made cardboard boxes. Um, but also the really striking effect of the, f of the reduction in revenue as stuff starts to fall off patent. And you can see the, um, the fifth column over shows the really dramatic number of drugs that were due to fall off patent by 2012. So anybody who looked at this data in 2006, 2007 could see the road crash coming. Surprisingly, very fewer investors did. And you could see um, uh, exactly what has happened and rolled out over the past few years. Major changes uh, in the structure of the industry, uh, a major consolidation in some bits of the industry, a reduction in R&D spend rather than an increase in R&D spend, and challenges really across many of the major um, uh, companies in the sector. So that, that sort of reveals um, the problem. And the problem really uh, relates in pharma to the failure to grap grapple with the issue of how do you get innovation in a large, complex company. Uh, this, of course, um, involves often getting access to new technologies or addressing a new question. Uh, in many ways, it's very tough to be completely novel, but having a large background in research in a particular area often provides the in-house expertise to A, be the first into the clinic with new compounds, but also to leave everybody else behind because your in-depth knowledge of a particular system 
And, and that's actually often not the case in pharma. You often find that five or six companies all enter the clinic about the same time. There's a tendency that because one company is developing a drug, everybody else has to develop the same thing. And as a result, the notion of innovation has actually rather been lost in many, but not all of these companies. And, and it's important to think in biomedicine where real innovation comes from. And there are a couple of really good examples. The top picture is the old, not the new, but the old laboratory in molecular biology in Cambridge generated a dozen Nobel Prizes since 1952, single site, very able scientists, basic and some increasingly translational scientists, sitting at the convergence of two separate disciplines, in this case, physics and biology. And the picture below it, which is Genentech, which was an equivalently exciting and highly dynamic structure based in a single site with a load of very, very talented scientists trying to develop some of the early tools that were generated by the early days of molecular biology. And both have, in different settings, created hugely innovative products and opportunities in the healthcare setting. What it isn't is an organizational structure. And this, again, has been confused in pharma, um, that if you get an organizational structure right, it'll, it's bound to generate innovation. The reality is it almost doesn't matter what organizational structure you've got. It correlates very badly with your innovative culture. And so that is not the explanation. And certainly we also know that in fact size and resource is almost inversely correlated with real innovation. And there are almost no exceptions to that rule. So as you get larger, it becomes much, much more difficult to be really, truly innovative. And, and there it lies some of the story behind the challenges that pharma has. There are a number of business models that one could think about that both discourage innovation and could encourage it. Large R&D structures, very adverse to um, innovation. Focus on fast followers rather than novel compounds. Tendency to isolate yourself if you're a big company thinking you can do it all, and as a result, not getting the flux of ideas from outside a very defensive model with regard to safety and the likes. But there are also a huge other set of opportunities for driving innovation. Uh, and those are ones that I think have been adopted and implemented by many mid-sized and small companies and a few large companies that have actually been hugely beneficial in those cases. One of those is patient stratification. And this gets back to the point I made earlier that in fact most human diseases is defined in a way that was really laid out at the beginning of the, of the 20th century around phenotypic descriptions of patients. What did they complain of? What did they look, at at the, look like at the bedside? Which particular organ was affected? And we now know, based on particularly diseases like cancer and inflammatory disease, uh, that, that, that that's not the way these diseases work at all. Um, each one of those big lumps of disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, is made up of a whole range of different mechanistic processes. And understanding that will allow one to generate drugs that really work with very substantial efficacy, albeit in smaller numbers of patients. Uh, and that is ultimately the way that many of the new and very powerful new drugs that have been successful have been developed. This is a uh, of course, a, a well-trailed slide of Zelbaraf, which is the BRAF inhibitor developed by uh, Plexicon and subsequently by Roche. The picture on the left is a man with end-stage melanoma. The picture on the right is two weeks after he's had the drug. Uh, those are the kind of drugs that will transform medicine. Now, as it happens, about six months into this, subclones of this disease recur. So it's not quite as good a story as the picture might lay lay out, but if I'd shown you that picture 10 years ago, no one would have believed that you could even get to that point. And this is the way I think that the, the innovation of drug discovery is like to really, really transform, particularly the field of cancer medicine. So the really big guys have got real issues about innovation. It's a real challenge. It's really hard. Some have managed to do it, but most have not managed to do it. And uh, you will have spotted the fact that Many of these companies are reducing their spend on R&D simply because they're not very good at it. And it may well be that the models change so that those organizations 
end up more as large marketing organizations. And the few that are very good at research will stay at research, but, but everyone will depend on a pipeline of novel things emerging from smaller, more innovative and light on their feet companies. I like to talk about mid-sized companies, not because they're particularly mid-sized in terms of their market cap, but they do represent a different sector, a different attitude, a different culture, and in many cases, a very different structure in the way they think about themselves. There are four here. These are all really innovative companies, and they all have a number of features in common. One is they're all pretty new. Um, they're relatively new entrants into the pharmaceutical arena. Secondly, they all have a single therapeutic area of focus. They mostly don't try and do four or five or six or seven therapeutic areas, which is the model for large pharma. Gilead, of course, pretty much owns virology in the HIV, hep C arena. Genentech was the dominant and still remains the dominant player in cancer medicines. Novo is really the dominant player in diabetes. And Celgene is another major player, particularly in the cancer space. These are really innovative companies, and they're where expansion and growth has been its, at its most successful. And I've just drawn a little picture here just to show you how these companies evolved. First of all, they didn't evolve overnight. You don't turn biotech companies into major successful companies with major products in a 10-year time frame. In fact, it's actually quite difficult to do in a 20-year time frame. But for investors who are prepared to wear it over a long period of time, these have been hugely successful. Celgene, which was created in 1986, licensed its first drug in 1998, so that was 12 years later, now has a market cap just under 60 billion. Novo's been around a bit longer, but of course was spun out into Novo itself um, uh, in the early 80s. Uh, it, ha it had insulin, of course, in play. Its most recent drug, Victoza, which is the GOP-1 agonist, uh, has made it one of the most successful drugs in terms of sales, uh, and it's got a market cap of 90 billion. Gilead, again, started in 1987. Tamiflu in 1999, and, and Tenofovin, which is their uh, HIV therapy, has, uh, and most recently their Hep C therapies, have now given a market cap of 113 billion. And Genentech, which has now, of course, been acquired by Roche, but went through this dramatic period of expansion from 1976 through the, the discovery and implementation of Herceptin, which was really one of the first great examples of targeted therapies. In the UK, we don't do this. In the, on the continent, these are allowed to grow because they're often owned by foundations and families. And in America, they've been allowed to grow because they're supported by deep-pocketed risk capital investors who are prepared to wait 15 or 20 years to see the benefits of their investment. That, I think, is something that the UK needs to think about. And indeed, there are a couple of plays in place that may produce exactly that kind of investment in the sector over the next um, few years. It's also, though, really important to have this dynamic biotech space. Those mid-sized companies came out of small companies that had great ideas, great management, and long-term investment. And in order for that to happen, you've got to have lots of ideas that are very, very successful. Um, I, I think we've been pretty good at creating very small companies, very novel small companies in the UK. Some of them have been more successful than others. Where we haven't been particularly good is at growing them. But there are a, a number of lessons to be learned from that. And I've been very active in the biotech sector in the Oxfordshire cluster. And I just thought it might be interesting to walk through some of the examples that I've been directly involved in in the cluster, because they all tell you a particular story about what's necessary uh, for success in this arena. This is the classical model. Universities spin out small companies. They used to have IPOs. They used to then grow to mid-sized biotechs. Or there could be other forms of exits by um, uh, trade sales to pharma. And universities would also relate to pharmaceutical companies with research collaborations and licensing. That, if you went in the, to the early 1990s, everybody would draw that picture and say, that's the ecosystem, that's how it works, it's all terrific, everybody's gonna make a lot of money. Um, the reality is if none of it works. So the universities haven't been particularly good at this. 
The research collaborations with pharma have been wholly unproductive in my view and delivered very little to either party. Venture capital has virtually dried up. Uh, IPOs until this year have largely dried up and we haven't generated any mid-sized bi uh, mid biotech or pharma companies. So the old model is broken at almost every step. And I think that the only way to fix this is not to go away and say, oh, we need more venture capital companies. Because actually, if you just drop venture capital into that, it won't work. You've got to recreate the whole system and make the whole system more functional for it to work successfully. And of course, one of the biggest problems in this sector and I talk really about the discovery of drugs, not med tech, not diagnostics, not digital medicine, is the famous valley of death. Because it takes forever to go from where we normally start companies is with discovery to get to something that even vaguely looks like a product uh, at the end of phase two. And it's that length of time that wears your venture capital investors out, it wears out your founders, it wears out everybody. And by the time you get to that, it's no wonder we don't end up with mid-sized companies because everybody's had enough. And the problem here is that universities spin out companies far too early. If they spun them out three or four years later and could advance their way through preclinical and maybe even into clinical space, A, there would be better things to invest in, and secondly, you'd have a great deal more success in the entire sector. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But Firstly, I'll show you some examples of, of things that I've been involved with in, in Oxford over many years. When I came back from Stanford in 1988, I ran into that guy on the right whose name is Garth Cooper, some of you may know. He's a very bright graduate student, and he just discovered a, 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 an amyloid protein in the pancreas that was associated with type 2 diabetes, which was subsequently called amylin. I set up a deal between he and Ted Green, who was a friend of mine from San Diego, a venture capitalist, who again, some of you may know, which actually created the company called Amelin. This was 1988. They then looked around and said, well, actually, we want to build this company in the UK. There were no science parks. There was very little source of other venture capital. There was no facilities uh, for small emerging companies. So they picked the company off and moved it to San Diego. But this was based on UK IP, it was supported by a, a San Diego venture capitalist with very deep pockets. And the history of that company is quite interesting because it carried on from 1987 with the discovery of Amelin, IPO'd in 1992, which was possible in those days without a product anywhere really near the clinic, ran through and ultimately uh, um, had its first commercial product, Excendin, Excendin, which is a GLP agonist product uh, approved in 2007. So that was exactly a 20-year run. And Ted Green, of course, was with it through the entire thing. It was delisted from NASDAQ at one stage. It was all refunded, so on and so forth. But in the end, of course, as you know, the company was sold last year for $7 billion to, um, to Lilly and Merck, I think. But it, you know, this is a great story with several products on the market. But it wasn't a great UK story, because we didn't do it here, but it also re-emphasizes how long it takes. And if you want to play in this game and play for long-term success, you have to be patient. This is another company I was associated with. I was a founding board member of Paul Drayson's company called Powderjack. This was a med tech company, which grew very rapidly, floated very early, used paper to make a number of acquisitions, and then was sold to Chiron for $500 million about six years after it was started. So there are examples whereby those kind of exits can happen, but not largely in the pharmaceutical space. Oxygen was another company spun out of my lab. I helped found it. Um, uh, it was founded in 1997. Uh, it's still going, um, and it's moved from a genetic drug discovery company to a company which has uh, new small molecule inhibitors for a target called CRTH2, which is involved in allergic disease. This is a very interesting molecule because it's the receptor for PGD2, which is involved in many of the inflammatory response for allergic disease at many sites. And that was really discovered by a genetic approach. It's a totally novel target and a totally novel compound. Now, there are many fast followers in that region, but the reason people are interested in this is that in a population of asthmatic patients 
in whom you have high eosinophil levels, high IgE levels, and they're very atopic. You get very striking improvements in FEV1, as you can see here at the end of a phase two study, which shows that these molecules are likely to be very powerful oral safe inhibitors of these allergic responses. And in a disease area which has had no new, really new medicines in more than 20 years, these are relatively interesting programs. But over the 20 years that this company's been operating, lots and lots of people, about, about 17 years, lots of people have put a lot of money in. And again, investor fatigue is what's very likely to kill this program, even in the presence of reasonably good phase two data. And this is the sputamia xenophilia data, which is also very striking, eosinophils being a major marker for those sorts of inflammatory diseases. And the third company, so that reveals again this valley of death is really, really tough and makes it very difficult to make these companies successful over the long term. And this is another example of that. This company was spun out of my lab by the guy on uh, the left, Bent Jakobsen, um, and uh, James Noble on the right was its chief executive. This was a company that spun out around technology that we developed in the academic setting for expressing recombinant T cell receptors, which are responsible for identifying peptide antigens in a variety of different circumstances. That company started as a company called Avidex in 2001, 2002. It got bought and then bought back out um, as a management buyout by some of the people who were originally involved. So it's had a, a full cycle in and out of another company. But it's got a really remarkable set of technologies now developed called these IMTACs, which are recombinant T cell receptors which see targeted peptides on the cell surface and hence can set, sense out a whole range of new peptides inside cells, particularly cancer cells or virally infected cells. And the little picture at the bottom is one of the early patients treated a year ago who had an extensive sarcoma. Picture on the left, the black stuff's cancer. Picture on the right is post-therapy. This immunotherapy for cancer is now in a variety of hands showing itself to be a hugely powerful innovation. None of this was really developed effectively in large pharma companies, largely done in small companies. Uh, and there will be a variety of ways into it. But I think these companies, Adaptimmune and Immunocore, are sitting on really exciting position and are now collaborating with Genentech to advance those programs further. So, but even that has taken more than a decade to get uh, real clinical data, which will persuade you that this is likely to be a therapy in the end. So one of the questions, I think, is how do you change that whole life cycle of value in this sector? What can universities do to help to move this along? And that's something, of course, from my position that I think about a lot. And there are a number of different areas where I think universities have a very important role to play. Firstly, to, to help to evolve technology clusters, as you see in Silicon Valley, as you see in Boston, because it's in those clusters that you get a, a workforce which is highly entrepreneurial, incredibly innovative, and used to working across the academic commercial divide. Uh, the most successful of these, of course, involve multiple technology sectors, not just biotech, but also computing and IT uh, and other forms of technology. Uh, and there's obviously global competition to build large, capable clusters. We've just had a look at the cluster in Oxfordshire, which is actually pretty good. It's about the same size as the Cambridge cluster, surprisingly. It's multi-tech, it's across a number of different technology sectors, and it's pretty interesting. There are about 180 biotech companies. There are about 1,500 tech companies in this space. But by comparison to the major American tech clusters, this is very, very small, as indeed is Cambridge, which is about, in terms of companies, about the same size. But I, either one of them is really too small to compete in global terms. If, though, you take the southeast of England, Cambridge, London, London, Oxford, including the Thames Valley, the Cambridge cluster, and what's going on in London, it's actually, it's actually quite an interesting cluster. And my guess is, in terms of small companies, 
it's probably competitive with the Boston cluster and maybe even competitive with Silicon Valley. It has fewer mid-size or large companies, but it's still a pretty chunky space. And I think one of the ambitions that we've got is to try and glue this together so it functions more effectively as a cluster. That requires better trans transportation infrastructure and better linkages between the cluster as a group. But there is an opportunity there for the UK to play. And rather interestingly, if you look at the geography, it's bigger than either Silicon Valley or the greater Boston cluster, but it's not a lot bigger. It's about twice the size. And you can see those, if you superimpose those, A, on the M11 corridor in London, or B, on the West London Oxfordshire cluster, they're, it, they're, they're about equivalent to each of those North American clusters. So I think that's one of the interesting things that I think you're going to see emerging over the next little while. But there are also a number of new ways for university engagement. One is that universities have to stop trying to make money out of their innovations. Because on the whole, they don't. Not just on the whole, that they don't. And there's no point in pretending they do. And they need to recognize that it's one of their responsibilities to have impact by making sure that their discoveries get, uh, get, get, get utilized in society. And some of that has got to do with open innovation, which is the ability of multiple partners to play together to solve big problems, capability of doing more translation in conjunction with, with the commercial sector, proving tech transfer capabilities. And these two issues of shortening the gestation period for companies by hanging on to stuff longer is all really important to over reduce the burn rate of the commercial sector. The open innovation space, there are a few good examples. This is globally by far the most successful. There are now nine big pharmaceutical companies all working side by side on trying to understand how to make better drugs to novel targets using structural biology through this structural genomics consortium. Um, that's a major international effort, uh, but based here in the UK probably the best example of open innovation anywhere in the world. In terms of translation, the UK now has a really unique set of assets for taking novel drugs into the clinic. And I think one of the things that the big hospitals and their associated universities are doing successfully is developing the capabilities to do first in man and first in disease studies in a whole range of different diseases. I list a few of the uh, examples that we're doing in Oxford all of which are early, most of which are not subsidized by industry, but are just happening based on academic input and philanthropic support. Uh, and that's really been made possible by the uh, grants available through, this, by, through the funding of this and the previous government to the biomedical research base. It's very important to improve tech transfer. I've already alluded to the old model, which was universities thought that by taking a big chunk of equity and startup companies, it was all going to be terrific and they could fund themselves and build their endowments. It hasn't worked, hasn't worked anywhere, didn't work in Cambridge, didn't work in Oxford, uh, certainly hasn't worked in London. Uh, this is not a model that's worth pursuing. And so the model that I think we're certainly looking at in Oxford is whether there's a way in which the university can, through its grant income, cover off the cost of the patent portfolio and then make it easy for companies to be spun out by not taking large equity positions in those companies, but to allow the risk capital community to invest in those, ideally later in their evolution than we have before. And that gets to this issue about shortening this valley of death, which I think is central to everything. Lots of people have tried to do this. It's actually quite difficult. But now a number of institutions, uh, univer major universities and their healthcare partners are trying to take more responsibility longer with molecules and discoveries so that we take them through preclinical, even into man, before we look for commercial partners. And what that means is there's much more data reducing the risk of these compounds because you get much more robust data about their potential utility. And, that there, and, the, and the trajectory to ultimate success is much shorter, making it a much better investment for the risk capital community. There are now strands of support for this that are out there in the public and the private sector. The biomedical catalyst that was in introduced by this government as part of the life sciences strategy is a good example. That's been renewed again. It will be 360 million in that pot. The MRC has its own money for this. The Department of Health and IHR funds this space. 
And of course, philanthropy is a major source of funding for this particular sector. Much of that philanthropy coming from people who are interested in this sector in the first place. Uh, and also, of course, the need to do much more in the target discovery space so that the targets that we're pursuing are much better validated than industry was ever able to do. Again, like increasing the likelihood of success. And finally, how do you once you create a company, how do you reduce the burn rate of those companies so that the capital that goes in lasts much longer? And that's something that we've been working on as part of the life sciences strategy. Of course, most single product companies, biotech companies are hugely inefficient. They've got a chief executive, a chief financial officer, a head of development, a head of discovery, a business development officer. The burn rates, you know, three to 400,000 pounds before anybody's made a cup of coffee. And one of the ways around that is to have shared management teams that manage more than one single product company. We've started a bit of this with support from the Harrington Foundation uh, in Oxford. We've got two really good examples of that at the moment. And boy, it really does change the burn rate in these companies and the likelihood of them going on to be successful. If you combine that with shared space and accommodation close to clinical facilities and scientific capabilities, um, then you actually provide a really unique opportunity for these companies to get airborne without burning vast amounts of money using CROs and a variety of other methodologies. So that uh, we're just in the process of building this in Oxford, which is a, called the bioescalator, and it's intended to do exactly that. It'll house multiple small companies at every stage. Some still ideas in academia that are being developed into companies. Uh, others will be initial companies that will be in shared management models that will allow them to benefit from all the substantial infrastructure in the Oxford Medical Campus that will allow them hopefully to be more successful. So um, in conclusion, um, I hope I've been able to take you through what I think are the issues associated with these three key bits of the commercialization strategy for innovations that come out of biomedicine. There's never been a better period for discovery science in biomedicine. We know more about mechanisms of disease, we've got more tools available. But what we haven't been able to do is convert that into a commercialization models that are increasingly successful. And I think some of the suggestions I've produced to you today about what works and what doesn't work may be ideas that we'll be able to go forward with in the future. So thanks very much.